Hello, it's me, Slimeborger. In Season 1, Episode 12 of The Wire, yes, I'm actually doing this, minor spoilers upcoming, by the way, Corner Boys Bodie and Wallace are having a conversation. Unbeknownst to Wallace, Bodie has been ordered to kill him by a higher up in their gang named Stringer Bell. My mom used to put Mad Bacardi in her, though. It wasn't much she didn't pour it into. Did you man, saying talking about your mom like you're still a kid. Well, I got the thinking on him. Your ass ain't got to be hard all the goddamn time either. Soft link, break the chain. Bodie later kills Wallace, again asserting his hardness and manliness over him. Come on, you be wet in your pants like you a little boy, be a man. Stand up like a motherfucking man. Do it, goddammit, if you're gonna. <laughs> Bodie is a loyal soldier to the end. He is hard because that's what his leaders require of him. That leads him to killing his friend Wallace and ultimately to give his own life in service to the cause. But his hardness here really only benefits the leaders of the gang. He dies on the streets, not living in the lap of luxury like the gang's leader, Avon Barksdale, or Stringer Bell for that matter. That sense of duty, that he must be hard and uncaring for those around him, to shut himself off from the empathy he feels for his friend? That doesn't serve him. It's a tool to manipulate him. Bodhi sees himself as the adult in this interaction, and Wallace as a naive child, but Bodhi is the one being naive here. Wallace is right. You don't have to be hard all the time. It's actually profoundly destructive to be hard all of the time, and it costs Bodhi his innocence and his life. See, Bodhi's not a villain here. He's a tragic character. He's a kid trying to live up to the expectation set on him, a model citizen of the fucked up power structure he lives within, eager to do what he thinks is best for the enterprise and community as a whole. He's romanticized the idea of being a tough guy, a hard ass, what a man is supposed to be. Wallace sees this garbage for what it is, a grim necessity of their jobs that's ultimately not something to be sought out. It's something to be survived. They aren't the heroes of this story. They aren't even the villains. They're the pawns. Wallace knows he's being manipulated. Bodhi doesn't. But as pretentious as I am, even I'm not going to sit here and talk about The Wire all day. I could. But I won't. Ian Miles Cheong is perhaps the world's most embarrassing human being. Everything about him is regrettable in a way that makes you wonder, if man was created in God's image, what horrible God made Ian? Some kind of garbage god, like a toilet god, ruling over a turd heaven? I mean, Ian's probably not the worst person on the far right's content spewing machine. He's, he's, he sucks, but it's a pretty low bar to clear, you know? Like, there's a lot of really bad people out there. He is consistently, however, the most piteous. A hateful, spite-filled little troll that spends his days mad on Twitter and getting owned in every conversation he ever has with anyone. Last week, Ian went on a weird posting spree of men with pets, calling them pathetic for having pets. Sometimes because they took funny photos of them coddling their pets, like as a joke, but sometimes just, you know, like having a dog or a cat. Just being in a photo with an animal, that's pathetic. The most pathetic thing he's ever seen! That makes them soft, and according to Ian, you shouldn't elect soft men, soft in this case meaning Owning a pet. If you own a pet, you're too soft to do the grim business of politics. To do the terrible things which must be done. Your vision is too clouded by... Kindness. If you look through his Twitter feed, which you should only do if you have some sort of magic item that shields you from psychic damage, you'll notice he thinks a pretty heavy hand is needed to deal with the lawlessness of these protesters. When God is dead and the state refuses to enforce law and order, there is only nihilism and anarchy. It's the broken window theory applied to Christendom. We've uprooted faith all across the world. Lack of firmament, lack of culture. Nothing entices people to do well or be well. No, yeah, no, sure. For sure, nothing entices people to look after one another except for, you know, the natural impulse to care for other living creatures, which you think is soft and weak. It's okay to be a fascist when the alternative is complete lawlessness and rampant violence, wouldn't you say? Well, you know, good point, Ian. Nothing curves rampant violence quite like... literally fascism. 
This guy is saying in this now deleted tweet, we should enact fascism to stop people protesting themselves being murdered by police. Now, I would argue that police murdering with impunity or doing war crimes to intimidate protesters is already fascist, but Ian seems to think the police haven't gone far enough. And in that spirit of strength, he backed down and deleted that tweet when too many people got mad at him. Soft men, with their soft feelings, will consider the safety of the hordes of criminals. A hard man, a man who's just so hard. And I want to be hard. When I think about him, I just get harder. He'll do what needs to be done. This type of thinking is pretty common, though most people are not mind-poisoned enough to state it with such black and white terms. Men are not meant to be emotional caretakers. They're decision makers and violence doers. Women do the boring shit of making sure everyone's feelings are okay and that they're alive because they got food and water. Boys don't cry, they play with little power tools and violent army toys. Girls have pretend kitchens and baby dolls. That's all just biology. The type of toys you play with is just basic biology. It's based on the toys found in nature according to the biggest pieces of shit on the planet anyway. Men are stronger and therefore they should do the violence because what you want, of course, is for the violence to be as plentiful and dangerous as it can be. The idea that maybe nobody should do the violence, maybe we ought to have less violence, doesn't occur to them. There's always going to be violence, so you, you better be good at it or you're going to be the one who gets violence done at you. You'll be the victim. Last week, Ben Shapiro, noted manly man, went on a rant about how empathy is actually a bad quality in elected officials. How empathy makes you irrational and incapable of making clear and advantageous decisions like a feelingless robot presumably would do. So Morgan Freeman led off the season with a bizarre, meaningless video about empathy. Because, of course, the implication is that if you disagree with kneeling for America's systemic racism, you're not empathetic. Benjamin, how can something be simultaneously meaningless and carry an implication? Okay, there's only one problem. Okay, empathy is actually kind of bad for politics. The reason that empathy is bad for politics is because it leads you to empathize with people that you are more likely to like, as opposed to people you don't like. I look forward to seeing you cite a source for this. Okay, so the, first of all, the pitch for empathy is actually, there have been several books that are written on this, social science books, talking about how empathy is not actually the best thing for politics. It actually almost deactivates the reasoning centers of your brain. Wait, you just said that the problem with empathy was that it led you to empathize with people who you like, but now you're saying the problem with empathy is a different thing, which is that it turns off the reasoning center of your brain. But oh, sure, all right, Let, let's, hear your, let's hear your citations for this claim. Oh, several books have been written, okay. Social science books, no less. I can't wait to hear one of their titles, or an author who's written such a book. Because when you're empathetic, you don't actually create good policy. This doesn't mean that feeling sympathy for people is a bad thing. It means that if empathy is what drives your policy making, you're probably not acting in a rational fashion. But the, the, the real goal here is, of course, not to generate empathy. The real goal here is to suggest that if you disagree with the idea that America is systemically and institutionally racist, you're not an empathetic person, and therefore you're a bad, cruel, and callous person. If the goal isn't to create empathy, why does it matter that empathy is bad? And even even if even if that weren't the goal, Ben, did you know that baseball players actually don't form public policy? Did you know that's a thing that that baseball players typically, and this is also true of Morgan Freeman, don't do? The the idea is that that. Empathy is really about, it's really a moral statement about what kind of good person you are. And you can't watch baseball until you say it along with Morgan Freeman. You can't. You can't just watch a game and be distracted, which is the goal of sports. Ben is marginally less pathetic than Ian, so he makes a more coherent case for this position with less overt displays of his own insecurities. Now, personally, I'd prefer if we didn't have leaders making all of our choices for us, but failing that, I'd at least like my leaders to have my best interests in mind. I would like for that to be the expectation, you know? Like, it seems really weird and self-evidently undesirable that these guys are arguing that kindness and regard for others is a bad quality for people who are entrusted with the safety of others. 
And I get the faulty logic of it. Divesting oneself of emotional attachment allows you to step back and view the big picture. Caring too much about people's immediate well-being or wanting to prevent harm coming to them in the short term could blind you to longer-term harm. But here's where that logic goes off the rails a little bit for me. If you didn't care about the well-being of others, why would you be incentivized to do what's best for them at all? If they were actually uninterested in the well-being of others, they'd use any leadership position to enrich themselves. Everyone else be damned. They'd be really corrupt. They would just... Oh, okay. Yeah, now I get it. That makes sense, actually. That I forgot that's the guys they like. Ben at least makes the distinction between empathy, which is irrational and bad, and sympathy, which is neutral and could, in theory, be good. I think he gets them backwards because the distinction he makes makes no sense to me. The reason that empathy is bad for politics is because it leads you to empathize with people that you are more likely to like, as opposed to people you don't like. Okay, so this doesn't mean that feeling sympathy for people is a bad thing. It means that if empathy is what drives your policymaking, you are probably not acting in a rational fashion. We can only feel empathy for people we like? Uh, I don't know, man. I feel I can tell people's emotions pretty easily, even if they're very much not someone I would like. It's possible I'm giving him too much credit here, and maybe he's using the terms as synonyms rather than antonyms. It's unclear from the way that he's speaking. And Ben is telling on himself a little bit. To just take it for granted that you can't feel empathy for people you don't like, that explains so much of the way he sees the world. For the record, I don't like Ben Shapiro, but I think it's pretty clear in this clip how he feels. He's angry at the insinuation that because he doesn't care about people, that makes him uncaring, and that he can't turn off his brain even more than the normal amount that it is turned off to watch baseball without Morgan Freeman asking him to think about someone else's feelings before the game starts. You don't want caring and therefore weak, soft men to lead. You want hard men. I want them to be hard. So hard. If your decision is based on numbers, on the cold, hard facts, that's you doing the job as an elected official. You're not letting the soft, namby-pamby feelings of others influence your choices, but rather logic, reason, etc., which makes sense. You wouldn't want someone making instincts based on their gut or ignoring experts. So, okay, let's say someone took a cold, hard look at the facts and realized there was a problem in America with police brutality against people of color. Let's say we were in the middle of the biggest American mass uprising of the century largely because of that fact. Let's say that you had the power to take out an ad in a baseball field to bring people's attention to the problem without naming it or actually doing anything about it because you're a big evil company that doesn't actually give a shit but want to give the appearance of giving a shit. But even though the numbers are on your side and most people would commend you for doing it, a few extremely fragile ding-dongs would be offended. What is the logical decision here? Do you listen to the numbers or do you listen to Ben Shapiro's feelings? It's not helpful to be empathetic with communities being brutally oppressed for generations, but you should empathize with a guy who just wants to watch a ball game. What's next? They're going to sing the national anthem before every game? They're going to invite the president onto the mound and have him throw the first pitch? Both of these bizarre takes are trying to sell you on the same idea. You shouldn't feel bad for the people that must be brutalized. A wave of brutality must come to suppress the barbarians at the gate, and it'll be tough. But a strong leader needs to arise to handle problems like this. A leader who is empathetic is just going to give in to the mob. We need a leader who doesn't empathize. Only he and his hardness can protect us. Protect us, hard daddy. Protect us from the scary antifas and black people. Your natural instinct upon seeing people being brutalized, upon watching mothers grieve their sons, seeing the jackboot of the state slam into the skull of the people around you instead of the far-off skulls you don't get to see on your Twitter feed, you would want to empathize with that. You just can't help it. But that makes you stupid and weak. You see the game being played here, right? The idea is to make you think that being able to relate to one another is actually a bad thing. That coming together in the face of injustice is bad, actually. Not simply in this instance, but like, in general, you know? Oh, these people out there saying that if you don't care about other people's suffering, that you're cruel? That's unreasonable. I shouldn't have to care about other people. I got baseball to watch and I'm hard, baby. I'm a hard man. We like to point and laugh when guys like Ian Miles Chiang and Ben Shapiro tout the virtues of masculinity and hardness. 
They're not exactly prepared to go out and kick ass. They're not tough. I mean, neither am I for the record, don't get me wrong. But I could beat both of these dweebs in a fight at the same time. Easily. I'm, I'm much stronger than either of them. But I don't go telling people to harden up either. I don't go around demanding a toughness from others I can't exhibit in myself. The thing is, they don't see themselves as tough guys. They think the tough guys, the guys they're encouraging you to be, will be the ones they manipulate. They think of themselves as the chess masters, the toughy boys, as their pawns. They think they're like Stringer Bell, except, you know, definitely not black. And all of the men listening to them are like Bodhi. Their pride can be used to make them act outside of their best interest, to cultivate a meaningless, toxic aggression that they can exploit. Or at the very least, they hope to curb a person's natural impulse to care about others, lest they do so and realize, hey, wait a minute, I don't like the fact that people are being murdered by the police for no reason. Beep boop, I am a computer, according to my calculations, caring about each other is bad. Thing is, there's only so strong a single person can be. A single man is limited by their own muscles, their own body. But if we cared about one another, if we looked out for one another, kept each other safe and healthy, there's no upper limit on the strength that could be established. People working together will always be stronger than people working alone. Except in the instance of Ian and Ben as a tag team versus me in the ring, where I would win, handily. A community of love, solidarity, and mutual aid produces stronger people than a community of backstabbing, sabotaging competition. You know what the most dangerous animals are? Mothers. The caretakers of the young. They fight harder and more fiercely than any other animal. Hell, you could trap a human baby under a burning car and its mother will develop literal superpowers to rescue it. I mean, don't do that. I'm not, I'm not saying you, when I say you could do that, I don't mean go do it. I'm, I'm using it as an, it's a thing that taking care of others doesn't make you weak. It makes them strong. And if everyone takes care of everyone else, it means someone else is taking care of you, making you strong. I should know. I've been taking care of all of you. I've been protecting you. You have no idea the things I've seen, the things that have seen me clawing away at my mind in the deep, deep night, calling to me. I'm, I'm trying to hold them at bay. I want to save you. I don't know how much longer I can last. Hello and welcome to the Eyeball Zone. Here in the Eyeball Zone, we seal the fate of small leftist projects that need eyeballs on their work. It's all well and good, Mr. So-called Thought Slime, for you to talk about being all lovey-dovey, keeping people safe, and all that soft boy shit. But how does that apply to a combat situation? What if you need to use big, cool guns? I don't know, I don't know shit about guns, but do you know who does? Talk to Cool Girlfriend runs a YouTube channel where she discusses guns in a calm, safety-oriented, and instructive way. In the two videos on her channel so far, she walks you through the basics of firearm safety and how to create a basic first aid kit. Being able to fight isn't just about being good at fighting. It also means knowing how to survive a fight, how to minimize risks in a fight. It means not being a macho doofus who runs in guns blazing and is a liability to themselves and their comrades. Do you have a small leftist project you'd like to see featured here in the Eyeball Zone? Send me no more than one email with the word eyeballs somewhere in the subject line and pertinent details, for example, your pronouns, and perhaps you will find yourself trapped here in the Eyeball Zone. That's another video in the books. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, please press the I enjoyed it button, which is a little thumbs up. It's, uh, it's on every video in, on YouTube.com. You can press it on any one that you want. I would like it if you pressed it on this one, but I understand if you don't. You can also subscribe for new videos every Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but hey, maybe you want even more videos than that. I, well, I can hook you up with some videos. I've got another channel called Scaredy Cats where I talk about horror movies, where I post new videos every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But maybe that's not enough videos for you. Guess what? I got even more! I got a channel called the Mega Slime Entertainment Zone at youtube.com slash Mega Slime Entertainment Zone, where I post video game Let's Plays, and I post a new video every dang day, sometimes twice, at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I also do weekly live streams on Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and uh, 
that's some of the things that I do that you can get extra content from me if you like m m my styles. Thanks as always to my backers on Patreon who make my work here possible. Uh, please be patient doodle wise. I am moving and I'm also planning a wedding. So my life's a little, a little bit busy right now, uh, but I'm not taking it for granted. I am, I'm going to get those doodles out to you. Even if you stop donating, I will still, you'll still get the doodle. No one's getting cheated out of their doodles. It's, it just, it might take a while. Okay, that's all for me. That's all of the things I say at the end of the video. Goodbye forever.